please remain standing for the reading of the word. Today we'll be reading from Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8. If you do not have a Bible, the ushers are walking down the aisle. We'll be glad to hand you one. If you don't have one or at home or you know someone who needs one, please take this as our gift. If you do have one of the Bibles that have just been handed out, it, we'll be reading from page 903. For I delivered you as a first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sin in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then all the apostles. Last of all, as, he, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Dear God, we come together today. This is the basis for our beliefs, and we ask that uh, you be with Pastor Mike during the sermon. We ask that we have the eyes uh, to see, the ears to hear, and the heart to believe. Amen. My name is Mike Lee, and I get to be the pastor here at Mission Valley Church. Uh, if you and I have never met before, I would love to do it. If, if this is like your third Sunday and you're like, hey, who is this guy? Well, I'm sorry I was gone for two weeks. Uh, I don't usually take two weeks off, but I did this time. Uh, and if we've never met, I would love to do that. And so there's a couple ways that we can meet. The first is this. At the end of the service, I'm going to be standing out in the courtyard. Uh, I'd love to shake your hand out there, fist bump, hug, whatever you're into. Somebody did all three with me this morning. Where's Jim Dye at? Jim Dye today gave me a fist bump, and then he shook my hand and hugged me. I've never had that happen before. It was the trifecta. Um, yeah, I don't recommend it. It's all right. Um, but, you know, nine out of ten, don't recommend. Anyways, uh, the other way that we can meet, if you want, fill out one of those Connect cards. Uh, it, we talked about it at the beginning of service. We'll talk about it again at the end. Turn it into the info table, and somebody will give it to me, and I'll reach out to you this week. And then the third way that we can meet, if you want, send me a text, 602 602- 763-3331. Uh, if at any time during the week you want to talk to me, if you want to text me, if you want to share a funny joke with me or whatever, uh, reach out that way. Uh, I love to do that. So I'm so glad that you're here today as we continue our sermon series through the book of Corinthians. And this particular section of Corinthians, we just decided to call it the most excellent way. We are learning from Paul's letter to the Corinthians how to live the most excellent way. And we are remembering every week that it's not if somehow we can live like this, then Jesus could love us, choose us, save us. It is because Jesus has loved us, chosen us, saved us. Now we are free to live the most excellent way. And in today's section of the letter, we get to uncover the best news of all. I mean, there are a couple of passages of Scripture that if I had to say you only get three or four passages of Scripture that you need to know, or three or four passages of Scripture that you get to share with somebody, or three or four passages of Scripture that you get to preach, today's passage is one of those passages. It is so good. It is the best news of all and will give us tremendous reason to sing. If you weren't ready to sing when you got up here, you'll be ready to sing at the end because this is such good news. This is something so significant that it literally changes everything for those that can believe. It is that big of a deal. It is the essence of our faith. It is why we do all the things that we do. It's a really big deal, and it will change everything for those who believe. And so I would start off by asking you, have you ever noticed how something can happen to someone, and it changes a lot for that person, but for those like right outside of that circle of influence, it doesn't change things uh, very much at all? For example, think about it like this. If you were to get a new puppy or if you were to get married or if you were to have a brand new baby, things would change significantly for the people involved close inside that circle. But just outside of that circle, life wouldn't change very much at all. Uh, for example, this is a picture of Nash Lee. He's my grand dog, I, I guess. I don't know. Somebody told me I got a grand dog. I think that's weird. But... That's cool. And this is Nashley. He's my grand dog. Uh, this is the dog. is a brand new puppy of James and Maddie. Uh, they're our youth leaders and, and, and my kids. And when they got this dog, we went over to their house. And James, they got this dog from a, a, a 
uh, elaborate doodle, a golden doodle. I think he's called a golden doodle. Maddie, don't get mad at me. Uh, I'm not like talking bad about your kid. They got this golden doodle from a golden doodle breeder, and they gave him all these instructions about how to like raise this golden doodle in the most perfect, the most excellent way a golden doodle could be raised. And they were like telling me these instructions, like when the dog's supposed to go out and when the dog's supposed to eat and how the dog's supposed to go to the bathroom and when they're allowed to take the dog on different trips. Like they have like this whole like 12 step process to like bring the dog out into the world. And I was like, holy cow, your lives have changed considerably, but my life hasn't changed at all. As a matter of fact, this is super fantastic for me because some of you know that I don't even like my own dogs, George and Bailey, the two worst dogs in America. I'm not a big fan of them because they'd be messing stuff up and they mess with my life. But I love Nash and here's why. Because Nash like came to my house last night. He's running around, he's playing, and he has to go outside. And you know what? Not my problem. Somebody else can go let him out. Not my problem. The other day, Nash came to church with James to pick up Maddie. And Nash peed on James. And I thought, ha ha, not my problem. I, this is fantastic. And I was like, this is why somebody called him a grand dog. I can't wait to get some grandkids. Like, just spoil them, do stuff with them. And then when they get fidgety or just go on home, I think it's going to be fantastic. Like nothing has changed about my life. But for them, it's changed a lot. And you understand these situations. You will literally go to somebody's wedding. Right? I've done this before. I've performed a wedding ceremony. And I will leave and be like, well, let's go get something to eat. I'm hungry. Or whatever. These two people's lives have just completely changed. But my life hasn't changed at all. And it's like that with some of these big life events. That for the people immediately involved in the circle of the event, things change. But outside that circle, nothing much. And of course, bigger events change things for larger circles of people. So many people have asked me, like, where were you last week? Well, we went to Boston. We went to Boston. We just took the kids and we, Penny and I Took, not all the kids, James had to stay here. Sorry. But you got that dog. <laughs> Anyways, um, we took the two little kids. And now that we have one less kid, we can do cooler stuff. And you're just kidding. Uh, we, <laughs> we took the two, like, leftover kids. And we took them to Boston. And we went and we went to, we saw these big historical events that had happened. Things like the Boston Tea Party, the shot heard around the world, uh, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. We see all these things that happened in Boston. As a matter of fact, we have a picture of Courtney. Throwing, this is Courtney, throwing the tea into Boston Harbor. You can pay to do this, you, and people will do this. You will go and you'll grab a thing and you'll throw it into the water, and then they'll ask you to pull it back in. And people pay for that, people like me. And it's fun, right? We, we did that. And you think about, like, wow, this was a really big event, the Boston Tea Party. It led to the, it led to the Boston City Siege, and it led to the shots heard around the world, and it led to the Revolutionary War, and it led to America, and it led to all these things. And this is, like, a big event, and it impacts a bigger circle of people. I will tell you all this morning that when we were there at the Boston Tea Party Museum, we got to drink the tea that got thrown into the water, like an exact replica of the tea. And praise Jesus that we're Americans, because that tea was horrible. It was horrible. Janine would never serve it here in, in the church, never. It's just awful tea. I'm um, so glad that we weren't here. But again, this thing changed things for a bigger circle of people, but even those things are temporary. Here's a picture of Samuel Adams's headstone. Uh, he, he is the architect of the Boston Tea Party. He is partially responsible for all the things that led to America becoming America, and yet he's dead. He's dead and buried at Granary Burying Ground with Paul Revere and 5,000 other people, half of which don't have a headstone. So even these big, huge events really only have a limited impact on a group of people for a specific period of time. But what Paul is writing to the church in Corinth today, what Paul is writing in this section of the letter, what I am preaching to you here at Mission Valley has so much more impact. What I'm preaching to you today for those gathered here at Mission Valley and for anybody that's listening will change everything forever for those who believe. It will literally change everything forever for those who believe. That's the big idea today. The gospel changes everything for those who believe. It changes everything. It changes everything about your life. It changes everything about your eternity. It changes the way that you look at stuff, the way that you view things, the way that you value stuff. It changes relationships. It changes your status. So Paul opens up this section like this. He says, now, I would remind you, brothers, 
of the gospel I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Paul starts off this section of the letter by reminding them of the gospel. He says, I want to remind you of something. I want to remind you of something. They have already heard it before, but he wants to remind them. And who is the them that he wants to remind? Well, the brothers and sisters, that means the Christians, those who have believed. Paul is saying, those of you that have believed, I want to remind you of something that you've believed. I want to remind you so that you don't forget. And he is reminding them specifically of the gospel, the good news of Jesus that they have received, that has already been told to them. Paul is saying, I'm not going to tell you anything new right here. I just got done telling you some stuff. Last week, the last two weeks, Ben talked to us about uh, orderly worship, and he did a great job of preaching over those things. And there they were learning something new. But now Paul is saying, hey, I'm not, I don't have anything new for you today. I want to remind you of something that is so important, and you already know it, but I need to remind you what it is. Paul is saying, I'm not going to tell you something new. I'm going to remind you of what you have already heard from me and what you've already believed and for what you must hold fast. Because the gospel is that important. The gospel is that important that we needed to be reminded of it often. That it is important because it's believed and then believed again and again and again. A couple of weeks ago, we baptized two kids uh, right up here, uh, Dave and Sophie. We baptized Dave and Sophie. And I, I, right before they got up to get baptized, I kneeled down over there and I said, listen, here's what's going to happen. I say this to every kid or youth person that gets baptized. I say, here's what's going to happen. At some point in your life, somebody is going to try to convince you that this isn't real. Somebody's going to try to convince you that Jesus didn't really live a perfect life, that he didn't really die a horrific death, and that he didn't defeat that death by walking right out of the grave. Somebody at some point in time, whether it's in high school or college or sometime down the road, somebody's going to try to convince you that this isn't true. And I want you to remember this day, the day that you get baptized, as an anchor in your faith where you will be able to look at that person and say, you know what, I believed it so much that I got wet in front of my whole church over it. I believed it so much that I was willing to change my life over it. It's that important, and we need to be reminded of it often. It's why we preach the gospel every single week here, no matter what. It's important because it's believed, and then it's believed again. It's important, and it must be applied. One does not graduate from the gospel. You don't get past the need for the gospel. It's not like, oh, I got that. Let's go on to some deeper stuff. It doesn't work like that for Christians. People sometimes insult preachers like me for not going deep enough. People have come into me and said, you know, Mike, you're all right, but you don't go deep enough. They want to go deeper. And I don't even know what that means because it doesn't get any deeper than the gospel. It doesn't get any deeper than that. Paul wants the church at Corinth to know the gospel is as deep as it gets and is at the same time is as simple as it gets. My friend Jason Vance used to say it like this, the gospel is the shallow and deep end of the pool. It is why we preach it every week, because the, the gospel has the power to transform lives. The gospel has the power to save dead people to life. The gospel has the power to save sinners from hell to heaven, to save marriages from broken to healed, to save people from anger to forgiveness, to save parents from ineffective to disciple makers. The gospel is the message to save. And while it is simple enough to understand, the depth comes in the application. You want to get deeper in your understanding of what it means to be a Christian, join Jesus on his mission and start living like he's asked us to live. Can you and I look at the person that angers us the most in the world and know that Jesus lived a perfect life, died a horrific death, and defeated that death for that person too? Can you and I look at our marriage and say, man, we don't even like each other anymore. This seems completely hopeless. But Jesus had the power to, to be raised from the dead. And that same power that raised Jesus from the grave is living in us in the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus can save this. Can you and I look at our children and think, I just can't do this anymore. I just can't keep trying to protect them from this broken world and their own evil desires and yet say, but Jesus can because he restores things. Church, if you're looking for the depth, live it out. 
Let me say it deeper. If you're looking for the depth, live out the gospel. Live it out. Live out the good news and join Jesus on his mission. Go out into all the world. Teach people about Jesus. Baptize them in his name. Disciple them to be more and more like Jesus. The depth is not found in fancy sermons, but in going, teaching, baptizing, discipling. The depth is found in going near, far, into the ends of the earth. That's where the depth is found. If you're looking for depth, live on mission. So from this passage today, I want to share five key ideas about the gospel. And the first is simply this. The gospel is of first importance. It is the thing that matters most. It is of first importance. It is the thing we hang our hat on. It is the reason we're doing everything we're doing this morning. It is the only thing that makes a reason for people like us to gather on a morning like this in a place like this. It's why we do all of it. This is what Paul writes in verse 3. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. He said, I've handed it to you. I've delivered it to you. This gospel of which I'm preaching, I've delivered it to you as of first importance. This is of first importance. The gospel is of first importance. It is not in lieu of something. It's not just the beginning of something. It is of first importance. It is the depth and the breadth and the length and the width of the story. The gospel is why we're here. The gospel is why we gather. The gospel is why we sing. The gospel is why we serve. The gospel is why we baptize. The gospel is why we give of our time, our talents, and our resources to see the valley transformed by the power of what? By the power of the gospel. It is of first importance. The gospel is so important that Paul literally wrote, I am determined to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. If people say, I don't know how to share the gospel with people, I would say open up your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And read him this passage and pray that they would believe. Read him this passage because Paul's going to tell you everything you need to know to believe. He's going to give it all to you here. You don't have to go to seminary for this. You don't have to sign up for some 10-week course. You don't have to do anything. You have to watch YouTube videos. This is it. This is the crux of it. This is so important. I cannot believe what an honor and privilege it is to have God's word with us, to have it this simply, to know what the gospel is. The gospel is of first importance. And if the gospel is of first importance, then that means necessarily that everything else is of second importance. If the gospel is of first importance, then everything else that we hold on to so tight must at, at minimum, be, minimum be only second importance. Our preferences, the style in which we do things, our desires for how we would want to spend our time, our treasures, our talents, our ideas on what a relationship should look like, our very opinions on all manner of things are necessarily secondary to the gospel. The gospel matters most. Christian, the gospel is of first importance. It must be proclaimed and lived out and shared. So what is the gospel? Well, it starts with this. Jesus died for our sins. 1 Corinthians 15.3 says that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That Jesus died. We need to recognize that Jesus literally came down here and lived this perfect life and then he died. He died. It's really important that we understand this. It's central that we understand there's so much depth here. For those that say, I wish the sermons would go deeper. Well, it doesn't get much deeper than God himself coming down as a man named Jesus and living a perfect life before he literally dies on a cross to save those who would believe. I don't know how much deeper you can get than that. When people say, well, I want more depth, I don't know where it's at if it's not there. Who in your life has ever laid their life down for you? Who in their life has ever said, you know what, I will totally die for you. I'll totally do that. And yet Jesus did for all who would believe. There's so much depth here. You see, it's our sins that require the death of Jesus. And if you've never been to church or have never heard the name of Jesus, you probably know what sins are. They really fall under two categories. They're sins of commission. That's where we do the things that we're not supposed to do. We do those things that God would have us not do. We do them anyway. We know God would say things like, hey, don't eat of that one tree. We know that God would say, hey, hey, don't do this thing over here because it's not good for you. And we do it anyway. We do it anyway because we want to. 
We know we're not supposed to, but we do it anyway. That's called the sin of commission. And then there's sins of omission. That's when we fail to do the things that we're supposed to do. God said, in the form of Jesus Christ, go teach, baptize, disciple. And when we say, I don't want to, I don't feel like it, well, that's a sin of omission. I'm just not going to get around to that today. I'm really busy, God. Well, what is it that you're doing? Well, I got this stuff. I got these jobs and these kids, and I got the, the sports, and I got the cardinals around. What do you want me to do? Right? That, that's a sin as well. These sins, and we know what they are, the times that we don't do what God wants us to do, and the times that we do exactly what he's told us not to. And sin always has the same pattern. As Christians, we should get so good at recognizing sin. Because the sooner we recognize sin, the sooner we can put it to death. The sooner that we get, like, oh, wow, this is sin. Sin's happening in my life. I'm sinning. The sooner we can stop it, put it to death, repent, and turn back to the Lord. Here is the pattern. First, desire comes from within our own sinful heart. We literally want stuff that we know we shouldn't have. We just do. We want it. We know we shouldn't have it. We want it. And we don't want to do things that we know we're supposed to do. We just don't want it. It's our own heart. It's like it's not coming from somewhere else. Nobody else is tempting us. The Bible literally says that sin starts as a desire in our heart. We want what we should not have. Like we want me time when we should be on mission. We want some me time. I need some me time. Look how busy it is. I need some me time. We want that me time when we know we're supposed to be on mission. Or we want that relationship that we know is not God honoring. We want it. And if we give in to that desire, it leads to sin. If we give in to the desire, it leads to sin. Like if we skip church to enjoy a me day, or we skip reading our Bible but have plenty of time to doom scroll, or if we partake in that relationship that we know is not good for us, or God honoring because we want what we want to get from it, when that happens, when we give in to that desire, it's called sin. And we sin all the time. Most of us will sin before we make it out of the parking lot today. We'll give in to some desire that wasn't for us. We'll rush along a conversation because we want to hurry up and get the baptism treats. Or we'll drag the kids out of here because we want to try to beat the Protestant other people to the, to the lunch. Or the Lutherans. We want to get to lunch before the Lutherans get there. Right? Or whoever we're trying to beat to lunch. Maybe it's the Catholics. I don't know who they are. Maybe you're trying to beat people to, to lunch. We'll do that. We'll get mad at somebody in the parking lot because they cut us off. We'll do something like that. Most of us will sin before we make it out of the parking lot today. Not some of the very holy people. I, I see Scott's right here. I, Scott, I don't, Scott will probably make it all the way to 32nd Street before he sins. <laughs> very, very good guy. Very, very good guy. Very good. Heather knows. Heather knows. And when sin occurs, when we give in to our evil desire, it's sin. And then sin always leads to death. Sin always, always, always grows into death. What happens when we sin is it grows into death and it never grows into anything else. I've said this before and I'll say it again. If you were to take a little boy, he will grow into a man. And there is a 0.0% chance that he will ever turn into an elephant. Like a little boy cannot grow up to be an elephant. Sin can't grow into anything but death. And it will just be a matter of how bad the death is and how big the death is. I've said it before. It's the same with sin. It always grows to death. It leads to the death of trust, the death of relationship. And in this case, it leads to the physical death of Jesus. As Christians, we should be very afraid to sin because sin brings death. We saw this amazing picture in the Boston Art Museum, and I wish I would have taken a picture of it and showed it to you, but it wouldn't have done it justice. You know, like when you see something amazing like in, in, in person and then you try to show it to somebody else on your phone, it's just lame. But I saw this beautiful picture, and it depicts the moment that Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden. If you're not familiar with the story, Adam and Eve are the first man and woman. They are, they are just in paradise. They're in this place called the Garden of Eden. And basically their life is like, hey, worship God, walk around, talk to each other, name the animals, eat the food, and make a bunch of babies. Like that's their life. And God says, but I do have this one rule, don't eat of that one tree over there. There's like one tree, don't eat of it. And what do they do? They eat of it. They want it. What's in there? Why? I can't have that one. I can't. You can have everything you want, but not that tree. Well, that's the one I want. Doesn't that sound just like man? Doesn't that sound just like us? You can have everything you want, but not that thing. Well, that's the one I want then. I'd like that one. Can I get two, please? Right? And so they did. And so this artist draws this picture that shows them being kicked out of the garden. And they literally are walking out of this beautiful 
perfect world that God created into the broken world that you and I live in now. It's an amazing picture to think about how devastating sin is. And of course, as Christians, we know that Jesus died for our sins. And by paying that price, we're able to repent and experience forgiveness. But let us not lose fact, uh, lose focus of the fact that Jesus literally died for our sins. And of course, Paul writes, he did that in accordance with the scripture. Jesus' death on the cross was always the plan. God loved man so much that he wouldn't leave us in this separated state that sin gets us into. And so he had to make a way for us to come back. And he loved us so much that he sent Jesus down here to do that. Our sins required the death of Jesus. And we ought not forget that when looking at our own sins or at the sins of others. The gospel has to start with that. Jesus' perfect life and then Jesus' horrific death. Jesus literally dies for our sins. And then guess what happens? Jesus is dead and buried. 1 Corinthians 15, 4, that he was buried. It's pivotal that we understand that Jesus actually died. He wasn't just asleep. He didn't pass out. He died. And this is critical because if all Jesus defeated was the cross and the pain, then he wouldn't be Jesus at all. If the only thing that Jesus overcame was the cross and the pain and the humiliation that went along with the crucifixion, then he wouldn't be Jesus at all. But Jesus literally defeated death. Jesus conquered the very worst thing that this world has to throw at us, and he defeated that. And because Jesus defeated death, then death has no power over him. Can you stop and think about this for a second? The Jesus that we follow, death has no power over him. Death seems to have power over us. We're afraid to die. Like most people are afraid to die. That's why we're afraid of stuff like like spiders and and, and, and heights and and stuff. like. We don't want to die. We're like kind of scared of it. We don't want to. And Jesus would be like, death has nothing over me. And that's the one that we follow. And the good news is that if if Jesus has conquered death, if death has no power over Jesus, then death has no power over those who follow Jesus, over those who believe in Jesus over those who belong in Jesus. You and I have nothing to fear in death if we have believed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But Jesus was really dead. And when he really died, it seemed like all hope was lost. You could imagine being one of his disciples. You can imagine being his mother or being John, the disciple the Bible says that Jesus loved, and just thinking, man, this is it. He came and he did all these amazing things, these miracles, and now he's gone. And what do we do? What do we do now? He's he's dead because Jesus was really dead. Jesus was really dead and really buried and all seemed lost. And if the story ended here, we would have no reason to sing. But there's good news that gives us every reason to sing. And that good news is that Jesus is alive. Not Jesus was alive. Jesus is alive. Not like, oh, well, way back when they wrote this part of the Bible, Jesus got up and was alive for a little bit, and then he died again. No, he's alive right now. Like, if you wonder what Jesus is doing right now, well, he's alive. Well, I thought he died again. No, he never died again. He died the once, defeated death, and then went to heaven where he's sitting at the right hand of the Father and waiting until he comes back here. Jesus is alive. That is our good reason to sing. I could end the sermon right now, get off stage, and you would all sing loud because you're so excited that the Jesus we follow is alive. But I wrote some more stuff, so I'm going to go on. 1 Corinthians 15, 4 says, That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He was raised. He came back from the dead. He defeated death. He walked right out of the grave. 1 Corinthians 5 through 8, 15, 5 through 8 goes on to say, And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Jesus is alive. He conquered death, walked right out of the grave. And then he started to appear to his friends. He just shows up. There's a great uh, story in scripture. I wish I had time to read it today. Jesus is just, uh, just decides to go have breakfast with his buddies. Like, he's just like, he just defeated death. Like, what do you do after you defeat death? Well, you go have breakfast with your buddies. And he's just like, like let's, let's eat breakfast, friends. And he just appears to them. He talks to them and he teaches them and he performs more miracles for 40 days before he ascends into heaven. This is the pivotal aspect of our belief. 
Because if Jesus lived and taught and did amazing things, that's great. It's fantastic. If Jesus died a a horrible death for us, well, that's something remarkable. But if Jesus walked right out of the grave, if he defeated death, if he is alive, then he is Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, sent to save the world. And this is the good news. Church, for centuries, people have tried to disprove the gospel. For centuries, people have tried to disprove the gospel, and it would be the easiest thing to disprove. All you need to do is go to Jesus' body. All you would ever have to do is just say, well, he's still dead. If Jesus is still dead, the gospel is useless. It's nothing. If we could go visit the body of Jesus like we can visit the body of so many great people, Jesus wouldn't be Jesus at all. If we could go visit the body of Jesus, then Christianity would be the most expensive, time-consuming hobby on the planet, and Christians would be of all to be pitied most if we could go visit Jesus. But Jesus is not there because as the angel said, he is not here. He is risen. And because he is risen, Jesus is the King of kings. Jesus is the Lord of lords. Jesus is the Son of God sent to save sinful men back to God's presence. Because Jesus is alive and currently sitting at the right hand of God, it changes everything for those who believe. Jesus is alive right now, and one day he's going to come back and make everything right. Amen. Amen. And what do you need to do to spend eternity with him? final point today. If you believe the gospel, you're saved. If you can believe the gospel, you're saved. Look what happens to Paul. Verse 9 through 11. For I am least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. If you don't remember the story of Paul, before Paul becomes a Christian, he's out chasing down Christians, imprisoning Christians, standing there as Christians are being stoned. He is is going after those who believed in what was called at the time the way and persecuting them and trying to punish them. That's what Paul is doing when he is intersected, when his life is intersected. He says, I am unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Paul became a Christian not after he understood everything about Jesus. Paul became a Christian not after he got baptized. Paul became a Christian not after he planted all these churches, not after he worked so hard, not after he wrote letters to the Romans, the Corinthians, the Galatians, the Colossians, the Ephesians, and the Philippians, not after he was beaten. Paul became a Christian when he believed, when he believed that Jesus is the Son of God, when he believed that Jesus came and lived the perfect life, when he believed that Jesus did die a horrific death, that Jesus was buried, and that on the third day Jesus walked right out of the grave, Paul became a Christian when he believed. That's why Paul writes this in Romans, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him shall be not be put to shame. If you can believe in the gospel, you can be saved today. The gospel changes everything for those who believe. It changes everything. It changes the way we look at every aspect of life. It changes the way we look at money. It changes the way that we look at relationships. It changes the way that we look at leisure time. It changes the way that we look at problems. It changes the way that we look at forgiveness. It changes everything. It doesn't just throw off our sleep schedule like a new puppy does. It doesn't just change our status like a marriage does. It literally changes our eternity. It takes us from those who are on our way to hell and it plucks us up and puts us where our eternity is safe forever with Jesus in heaven. It changes everything for those who can believe. So can you believe today? Can you believe? Maybe you walked into this church and you were like, you know what, I'm just here to to see a baptism or I'm just here because a friend invited me. Or maybe I came because somebody drugged me along with them and they said I could get lunch afterwards. 
Maybe you're listening to this sermon or listen, or watching on YouTube. I, I don't know where you're at, but I would ask you, can you believe? And what is it that you'd need to believe? Well, you just need to believe the gospel. And around here we share the gospel like this. God made the world and it was beautiful. And it was perfect. And it worked exactly like it was supposed to. But then man sinned. And you know what sin is. We just talked about it. We sinned. And when we did, we... And you were like, you know what, I, I, I'm just here. I'm just here because a friend invited me. Or maybe I came because somebody drugged me along with them and they said I could get lunch afterwards. Maybe you're listening to this sermon or listen, watching on YouTube. I, I don't know where you're at, but I would ask you, can you believe? And what is it that you'd need to believe? Well, you just need to believe the gospel. And around God made the world and it was beautiful. It worked exactly like it was supposed to. But then man sinned, and you know what sin is, we just talked about it. We sinned, and when we did, we... And you were like, you know what, I, I, I'm just here... I'm just here because a friend invited me. Or maybe I came because somebody drugged me along with them and they said I could get lunch afterwards. Maybe you're listening to this sermon or listen, watching on YouTube. I, I don't know where you're at, but I would ask you, can you believe? And what is it that you'd need to believe? Well, you just need to believe the gospel. And around God made the world and it was beautiful. It worked exactly like it was. But then man sinned. And you know what sin is. We just talked about it. We sinned. And when we did, we... And you were like, you know what, I, I, I'm just here. I'm just here because a friend invited me. Or maybe I came because somebody drugged me along with them and they said I could get lunch afterwards. Maybe you're listening to this sermon or listen, watching on YouTube. I, I don't know where you're at, but I would ask you, can you believe? And what is it that you'd need to believe? Well, you just need to believe the gospel. And around